Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed epiphany season to all of you this Monday, February the 14th. I suppose I also should say happy Valentine's Day to everybody. And as we look at the love that we focus on today, we look to the light and love of our Lord Jesus, who shines on us from Matthew chapter 16. I am really excited to dig into these verses because these verses are chock full of truth, of the foundation of the identity of Jesus our identity as Christians, and also our identity of what we do in the church. This is something that's vital for our t- for our lives today. And as we go through this, a little bit of a warning, I, I think we might be able to get through all of our verses, which is verses 13 to 28, but also I want we're, we're going to dig deep. So if we don't get through all of the verses, don't be disappointed because it means that we have looked even more to Christ. So today we'll dig in for the gifts are ready ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word this morning, we welcome back the Reverend, the Reverend Terry Forkey, District President of the Montana District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Pastor Forkey, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Good morning. God peace to you and all the listeners. So, Pastor, tell us what's going on for you, your family, and the work of the saints in Montana. Well, <clears throat> a couple things going on right now in Montana that are pretty exciting for us. One is we're actually moving our district offices here probably within a month or a month and a half um, out of an independent building, something I've kind of desired um, into a, a local congregation that's building a new facility, and they've made room for us. So. Oh. That so we're actually <laughs> there's boxes and cabinets all around in my office and so on as we get ready for that move, and then at the same time uh, our district convention is going to be in June, uh, second week in June, so we're also in the throes of receiving overtures and delegate forms and all that goes along with having a district convention. So busy times right now. <clears throat> Well, then that's just a good reminder for you, our listeners, to pray for our districts. We have 35 districts in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Majority <clears throat> of them will be having their district convention this spring. Some have already had theirs um, into the summer months. So continue to pray for them and, and Pastor Forkey. Make sure that you pray for Pastor Forkey and the District of Montana. So, Pastor, as we are here to look at the Word of God, can you begin our study of Matthew chapter 16 in prayer? Yes, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you for the work that you've done through your Son, and specifically in bringing us to the knowledge of the true confession of Jesus as the Christ, and in that confession that you have received us as your children, so that we might have life and life eternal. We pray that you would strengthen our confession as individuals, and also our confession as the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, so that the true word of Jesus Christ Jesus as the Christ will go out go out into the world that more and more people can come to know him as the Christ, their Savior, that you might be glorified as your church is strengthened and grows. We pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our study of this text today, send us an email. KFUO at KFUO.org. KFUO at KFUO.org. Pastor, I'm going to start this way. Is I'll start by reading all the verses we have assigned for today, and then we'll come back for some of your introductory thoughts. We are in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in the 13th verse, all the way till the end in verse 28. We hear the word of God. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of our Lord today. Pastor, how do you want to begin? Um, there's a lot here. So how do you want to begin so we start off on the right foot? Yeah, there's a, there is an awful lot. So let, let's just do a little bit of context, a tiny bit of context. So immediately preceding this, um, you have the, uh, a number of healing miracles. You have the feeding of the 4,000. And then you have Pharisees and Sadducees demanding signs. And I would just kind of summarize that by saying, uh, in view of our context then, that there's a great deal of confusion about who Jesus is. Um, you know, is he just a miracle worker? Um, is he uh, somebody, someone more? Or is he, um, you know, a scandal to the Pharisees and Sadducees that need to, should be gotten rid of and so on? So confusion about who he is. And then right after this, is, of course, the transfiguration, um, where the disciples, at uh, least Peter, James, and John, uh, get to see him in his glory. And so I would say that there's, uh, um, there's some preparation for them in the text that we have before us, so that uh, they're kind of prepared for what they get to see, uh, see Jesus in his glory. And to put that in the context for the saints today, uh, certainly there's a great deal of confusion in the world around us about who Jesus is, not unlike that time, perhaps even in our own lives and the lives of your listeners. Um, people get confused and lost and kind of wander about. So there is an opportunity for a bold confession, and I, I think that's kind of where we'll spend a lot of time today, the confession of Peter, an opportunity for a bold confession is always healthy for us believers. Um, first of all, because it confirms our faith. Um, we get to speak with our own lips what God has put into our hearts through the gift of faith. And then, th- just thinking of the transfiguration, it, it also, we should always be prepared to see Jesus in his glory. You know, we, like, like Peter, James, and John, they didn't know what was going to happen when they went up the mountain. So also we have no idea. Um, You know, I might get off talking, get off the phone talking to you and walk out and get hit by a bus. Uh, We don't know when we will see the glory of God. And so these texts, uh, the the conversation that Jesus has with his disciples, with us, prepares them to see him in his glory, to see him for who he is. And, uh, that, that's good for us. So that's kind of where we're going today. And it to does see what it means to be the Christ. Yeah. And and that's something for me. And I'm I'm always I, I I really do think through the lens of teaching confirmation class, and this is exactly why we have confirmation. We even say it in in our in our right the, the continual you know he who um, confesses me before men I will confess before my Father in heaven. And that, that clear confession that we have our young people confirm, uh, other people, when, whatever age they might be, that as the baptized, 
this is what we confess, and we can't say, well, we're not exactly sure who the Christ is, especially after you read our text today and how important it is today, as you said, that there's a confusion of who the real Jesus is. So that's that's on our hearts today, and as Pastor uh, very wonderfully uh, prayed for this this morning, we pray not only that it may be clear um, for us as individuals, but our whole church body and the church around the world. So, Pastor, I'm ready to dig in for a few verses. Are you ready? Sure. All right. So verse 13, I think we'll, we'll then go through 15. So 13 through 15. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Pastor, where do you want to begin? All right, so verse 13, uh, who do people say that I am? Who do men say that I am? Or the son of, I should say, the son of man is. So what's Jesus' interest in uh, um, what people are saying about him? Is he like trying to take a poll? Is, you know, is he interested in building up his, his image, uh, you know, sort of social media image or that sort of a thing? I would say no. <laughs> um, it, it only seems to be used as a foil to emphasize what the disciples have already had revealed to them. He doesn't, uh, uh, the disciples answer, but he doesn't really dwell on it. Uh, he doesn't dwell on the answers that other people give. He just moves immediately to the very personal, which we'll get to in a, a few minutes, the very personal question about who they say I am. So Jesus is not uh, worried about the answers of, of other people. He sets that up to contrast what the disciples are going to say. And then I think we probably should spend some time on this son of man. Um, we could probably spend the whole rest of the time talking about son <laughs> of man. True. So That's true. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do it fairly quickly, at least my take. Um, the title son of man, very popular. Um, Matthew uses it 30 times. And all 30 times, it's by Jesus of himself. So mm -hmm. Matthew's unique in that way. It's just, it's Jesus talking about himself as the title, Son of Man. Mark uses it 15 times. Luke uses it 25 times. John 13 times. So 83 times in the New Testament. 78 by Jesus of himself. So or almost irrefutable, Jesus talking about himself as Son of Man. Title he uses. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, that title is used 108 times in Ezekiel, excuse me, 108 times in the Old Testament, but 93 times it's in Ezekiel. So that's a really high percentage. Out of 108, 93 times it's in Ezekiel. As a title for Ezekiel, most of the time, God speaking to Ezekiel. Son of man, do this, son of man, say that, so on. So it seems that Jesus is identifying himself with Ezekiel through the use of this title, Son of Man. Why would that be? Well, it might be Jesus is the shepherd, uh, chapter 34 of Ezekiel. It might be he is the glory of God returning to the temple, chapter 43. It might be that he is Jerusalem, where, where the Lord is there, chapter 48. Um, I don't know. I, I would suggest that Jesus is identifying himself as Ezekiel as a prophet to avoid the charges of blasphemy if he calls himself the Christ or the Son of God publicly. And that's what we see uh, when we get down to verse 20, that he still is not ready for that to happen. So that's why I'm going to suggest that Jesus is using the title Son of Man. He first comes into the world as a prophet. not ready to identif be identified by the world because they're not ready for it, just like the disciples aren't ready for it mm. as the Christ. Now, uh, or haven't been ready for it, now they are, and they're going to hear this from, from himself, from Jesus himself. Now, a question that comes to mind with that, Pastor, because the first thing I, I think about is, is Jesus' baptism, where he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Um, and, and this is for my own question with that how would you how would you connect those two things sure um that's certainly an introduction and that's probably done it sounds like everybody hears it 
but I would say that that was the voice was specifically for John the Baptist to hear because John was supposed to be preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. And he needs to know. And he needs to know that because (laughs) he struggles uh, throughout his career. I mean, he's in prison. He sends his disciples out to say to Jesus, you know, are you the one who is coming into the world? Um, And Jesus answers with quoting the scriptures as to the work of the, of the Messiah. But um, yeah, John hears this. Yes, this is the guy. And and he refers to that, you know, this is the one that I saw the the the, the dove descending on. Ah, yeah, the spirit okay. of God descending on. Okay, that is great. That is a, it especially brings into context for your listeners to verse twenty, which basically he says, "Don't tell anybody." And I I don't want to reflect on that too much. We've talked about this on the program a number of times, but that does connect the dots very well, Pastor Forky. So. Thank you for that. We've talked about that in this program, too, about the Son of Man. Jesus is is speaking of himself in the midst of that, and he's always teaching and preparing them to know the truth. And they reflect on this, and they bring up, basically, prophets. So, the, And at the same time, it's clear that the people they're talking to are confused on what the Messiah is. Everyone's confused on what the Messiah would be. So, it, it well, it kind of feels like we're back at home. Yeah, right? there's a lot of confusion on who this guy is. And any thoughts on on the confusion, the different answers they give? Sure, um, it is kind of interesting that all three of the answers would require some form of resurrection in order for Jesus to fulfill ah, that. I, I don't yeah. know, you know, that, um, which would kind of discount the whole Sadducee thing. I mean, it seems like you know most of the people are kind of believing in some form of resurrection that John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, the prophets would come back. Um, but as I say, Jesus is not really interested in what people are saying. I mean, that's not the whole point. He wants to get to the point, and that is who he actually is and how the disciples are confessing that and, and what, it mean, what it means to be the Christ. And so then, so, he, oh, go, go, ahead. go ahead. No, keep going. Keep going. You have a thought. Keep going. It, well, I would just, you know, it's kind of interesting that the answers of the People, they're all pious. You know, they don't say, nobody says, well, he's a miracle worker. That, that doesn't appear in the list. Mm, mm-hmm. um, you know, or a charlatan or something like that. It's all biblical. It's all pious. But none of them approach the truth. And I would connect that to what Jesus is going to say to Simon Peter in just a bit. Um, that these answers have been supplied by flesh and blood. By the opinions of man and not by the Spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit of the Father. So that contrast kind of runs through um, from 14 on, on through the next couple of verses. And here, he then steps it up a notch, because I, I think about this in our own lives. If you were to ask me, what do people think of so-and-so? You kind of go through your list, and you kind of guess, and you try to look. But if someone then says, what do you think of this person? Well, that's a whole different conversation. You know, that's a whole lot more like the rubber has to hit the road. So Jesus calls him out. But who do you say that I am? What is Jesus doing right. for the for, to Peter and the disciples here? Yeah, it's even better. And I wish they would translate it the way the Greek kind of throws forward the personal pronoun you. If you were to translate it just pretty solidly, it would be, because the, in, the, in the Greek, the personal pronoun is the first word that appears. So it would be more like this. And you... Who do you say that I am? Ah. You see, you hear the emphasis. Mm-hmm. The, uh, ESV translates, but just, but who do you say? And when you read it, you did it properly, put the emphasis on the personal pronoun you, but it actually appears twice, sort of uh, in the Greek. And you, who do you say that I am? Or you could put the contrast, but you, who do you say that I am? So it is very, very personal. And, and they're, they're, they're being called on the line to make a confession. Now, I just give me the opportunity here to make this point. We live in an anti-confessional world. But, well, that's my assessment. Mm-hmm. We don't believe in making confessions, even in the church. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is some sentiment against making a bold confession, like Lutherans like to do. This is what we believe, and this is what we don't believe. Those kind of confessions 
are frowned on. We, we like to be uh, either wishy-washy in, you know, taking everybody's opinion into consideration um, uh, in that way of, of not making an offense against anyone or of just saying a sort of the apathetic or agnostic, I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know what to say. So Jesus doesn't provide any wiggle room for, for his disciples. And you, who do you say that I am? He, he, you know, he's pushing them to the limit to make a bold confession. And, and of course, Simon Peter comes through on behalf of everyone. Um, I, I should just note that 15, that personal pronoun, is, is um, plural. So he's asking all the disciples. Mm-hmm. He's not just asking um, one of the disciples. And, and this is something that's very important because there's a lot of space in life where you have to be diplomatic in how you address your family, your neighbors, and everything else. But here, Jesus does not allow any diplomacy. He, he does not, like, say, well, you know, you, you, there's some wiggle room on how you can confess me. He's put it all out in front of him, which is something that we as Christians, individually, as a church, as a church body, have to always make sure that we are, are not putting diplomacy into something where Jesus is very clear. And that's exactly what he's doing for the disciples. And it's a good challenge for me and for you, our listeners, is to make sure that we are bold in our confession, as Pastor has said so far, and, and for us to remember what the truth is and to confess it boldly for the sake of, of, of people's souls, of the church, and for the church um, around the world. So, so, Pastor, anything else before we move on to the, well, foundational next couple of verses? Um, I think let's go on. All right, verse 16. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Pastor, right there is uh, Dr. Gibbs in his commentary basically said, this is the linchpin. This is like the fulfillment of when Jesus went out into the desert and was tempted by the, by the, by the devil, basically asked, what kind of king is this guy? You know, what, what kind of kingdom does this guy have? And boom, it all comes together in verse 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. What is Peter confessing with these few words? Well, so... First, let me say, um, Peter answers for the disciples, which is apparently not unusual. But I, I think the temptation is to do is to turn Peter into something that he's not. Um, there's no indication that Peter's an elected official or, you know, he's the president or the chairman of the uh, Association of Disciples. Um, he just likes to speak. And the other guys, as is, is that happens, uh, as pastors like to know, or as pastors are well aware, um, if someone's willing to speak, everybody else will kind of let him speak. Um, I also want to just point out that this term, the Christ, is ten, used 10 times in Matthew. And it demonstrates that the Christ was a working concept in the knowledge of the people. It's used here, does that. And, and the 10 times that are, that are uh, where it shows up in the, in the book of Matthew. So, for example... I find this very interesting. Uh, in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men come to Herod, and they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? This is Matthew 2, verse 4. Mm-hmm. But the uh, wise men say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And Herod it gets his, um, his wise men, so to speak, chiefs, his priests and scribes and so on, and he asks them where the Christ is to be born. Same phrase, mm. the Christ. Where is the Christ to be born? Very interesting that he interprets this, these foreigners looking for a king, to he interprets it to be the Christ. So there's a working knowledge of this term, the Christ. Then let, I'll skip a few of them just for the sake of time, but go to Matthew 26, 63. Um, he's being, you know, uh, during his trial, being questioned by the high priest. And the high priest says to him, I adjure you by the living God. This is interesting. Um, tell us if you are. The Christ, the Son of God. Again, mm. uh, there is a there is a working concept of the Christ. We kind of, I, I suppose, a lot of people kind of tend to think that gone on so long, the the Jews have sort of lost this concept of a Messiah or the, the coming of Christ. They 
Um, they're not working with it. It's not a lively expectation. But Matthew's presentation of the term, the Christ, kind of belies that. There, there's a working knowledge of it. So Simon Peter doesn't just come up with this, uh, you know, out of the blue. It's part of the, it's part of the lively uh, discussions among the Jewish, um, at least those who, who know the scripture, is expecting, or they're expecting, the Christ. And then... He adds, so you are the Christ, doesn't really uh, um, to, you know, say much about who the, the Christ is just in that term for us, but he adds the, the son of the living God. So now the picture changes, um, and, and it's on the basis of Peter's confession, or we'll say the disciples' confession. It changes from just the prophet, as I, I argued the Son of Man is referring to, now this added feature of the Christ being the Son of God, and not only the Son of God, but the Son of the living God, we'll get to that in a moment, the people understand the Christ to be the Son of God. So now we're adding an element of divinity, not just the Son of Man, not just a prophet, mm -hmm. but God himself, and I don't think we, we dare miss that, that, that Peter is bold to say, you're the one who's going to fulfill everything that God has planned for us as the Christ because you are God in the flesh. It is, it's, uh, well, it's beyond bold. It's, it's crazy that someone would go that far right away like that. He is the one. He is the living God because he created and he sustains all life. And I want to get to more of this, which we will at the other side of our break. We are studying Matthew chapter 16 with Pastor Terry Forkey, and we'll be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. And welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 16 with Pastor Terry Forkey, District President of the Montana District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Now, Pastor, you ended on, I mean, I, this is like a preaching moment. I mean, this is, this is wonderful where you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and all that goes into that confession. And you, and you, you ended in kind of like, boy, how did Peter do this? Which is an interesting dynamic that Jesus actually does answer. But there's a lot that can be packed into verse 16, which is a central point, I would say, almost of the whole book of Matthew um, that points us to who this Jesus is. Um, Pastor, anything else you want to highlight before? Like the next few verses are exciting as well. So anything else on the first yeah. verse? <laughs> there's just too much, but I, I do want to emphasize again. So this is the first personal confession that appears in the book of Matthew as, as uh, Jesus being the Christ. Okay, sure. And, it, mm -hmm. and I, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot take that lightly in today's anti-confessional environment. We should take note of this. This is what believers do. They make the confession. And I want to say, I, I hope your saints that are listening that, that will hear this, that centuries later, we're still doing the same thing. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you're still doing the same thing. When you come together in church on Sunday, you make the bold confession. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. You're confessing that to each other. You're confessing it to God. And then you go out and live that faith. You're confessing it in the world by your words and by your deeds. The same spirit that brought that faith to Jesus is still bringing it into the lives of saints today. And 
sometimes in spite of ourselves, that same bold confession is still being made by his people, by God's people out in the world today. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, hesitate. I don't want to get this like, oh, Peter was a great saint and, and we never attain anywhere close. No, it's not Peter, as we'll learn in the next verse. Yeah. It's the Spirit of God who is at work, and the same Spirit at work in him is at work in the people of God today. To boldly confess Jesus, the Christ. In that bold confession, we continue to hear the rest of the story. 17, and I'll go through 19. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven." Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Pastor, these verses can be separated into a number of different ways. How do you want to? How do you want to separate it as we teach? Well, let's just. I, I think just kind of forward on, um, uh, just connecting up with the the previous verse. Well, so we've had this bold confession, and now Jesus grants us some insight as to how Peter. And we, or anyone for that matter, can know what does this the Christ mean? Um, first of all, Jesus' response confirms that Peter's answer is correct. And, uh, and it connects uh, uh, the Son of Man up to who Jesus is. Um, he really is saying that he is the Son of Man and now the Son of God. Uh, let, let's just take it kind of a sidebar here and do the flesh and blood for a minute because Jesus says flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Mm. So the, the phrase flesh and blood appears five times in the New Testament. It's always used to distinguish a human source from a divine source. Very, very important. Human source, divine source, because that comes up again here in just a moment. Uh, thoughts of man and thoughts of, or things of man and things of God. So flesh and blood stands for a human source. You, you did not get this from a human source. So I, I earlier made that contrast. Those who said, the some who said John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets, human source. The divine source, when God reveals, then the truth comes out. Jesus is the Christ. Here, Jesus says that God the, we'll say the Holy Spirit of God has revealed his identity. And so he reveals it to us also. Yet today, same, same spirit at work so that we might know the Christ. We don't come into this space by a rational, you know, by our own reason or strength, but the Holy Spirit of God reveals it to us. As it tells us in now, okay, okay. you're keep going. I love this. I, I love it. Keep going. I love yeah. it. All right, so let's let's look at this uh, Petros, Peter, and Petra rock because mm. there's so much confusion about it. Um, so uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm talking in Greek here. Petros is Peter, the name Peter, and Petra is the feminine. It's the rock, and there's, there's no doubt there's a little play on words. Jesus is not um, opposed to making this little plays, but we we shouldn't understand it as making Peter more than he is. It's, it's an acknowledgement of Peter's confession. But Peter is certainly not the rock himself. If Peter were the rock, Jesus could have said, on you, you are Peter, and on you the rock, or something to that effect. On you I will build the church. The rock is, as we're used to saying in our confession, the rock is the gospel-oriented identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, we should note, just for the fun of it, that Jesus himself is called the rock in 1 Corinthians 10.4. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a sort of double entendre, that is, the rock of the confession, but on the rock of Christ himself, the church is built. Uh, wow, what, are, what else do I want to say? Um, <laughs> it just keeps going. I love it. I will build the church. Yeah. Nobody else builds the church. This is 
I, to some degree, we're kind of past the sort of passe, the the whole um, this growth movement and all of the human endeavors to build the church. All of that is put to the lie with G- these just simple little words. I will build my church. Jesus does the building. Um, he uses means, of course, and people are the means, but we, we need to be very careful not to substitute human endeavors for the work of Christ as the building of the church. So uh, on the confession, the church is built on the confession of him as the Christ. Um, so the church, we better spend some time on that too. Mm-hmm. Matthew uses this word church. It's, in Greek, it's ekklesia, simply the called out ones or those who are called out. So Jesus builds on the, on the foundation of the true confession of him. He builds his church. It can't be built on anything else but the word of God, which is the true confession. And, and he does that by calling people out of the world or out of false confessions, out of the things of man into the things of God. It's a beautiful picture mm. um, based on the boldness of this confession and the divine revelation of it. That is, that God has revealed it to him. The church is not like the rest of the world. So also you, dear saints, listeners, you also are called out. And, and you're called out to make this confession that Jesus is the Christ. And this brings Can us. I go to, on. Yeah, I want to oh, just highlight ahead. one thing because I mean you're on a wonderful roll here because it it brings us to that 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 action of God who is living and as we know the Word of God is living and active that He's going to build the church that that built on the rock. This goes to the Him. The church will stand even when steeples are falling. That's where mm. Pastor President Forky, especially as you do your work in the Montana district and around our sin, a lot of people would be like, well, there's a lot of churches closing. There's a lot of churches on the verge of closing. What do you mean that he is the living Christ and he's still at work? How would you encourage and care for people who have who grieve that reality that surrounds them? Yes. Oh, that's so good because this is a this is a lively reality in Montana. Um it just so happens last Sunday I was visiting um, three small congregations. They're a triple parish. Um, they have maybe 30 people in one congregation. Uh, I should say an attendance on Sunday in one congregation, possibly 20 in attendance in another congregation, and probably a dozen in attendance in another congregation. So I have a big, long presentation I make, and then, and then part of it I say to them, are you afraid? that your churches are getting smaller and you're no longer going to be able to sustain. And of course, and they all, they all say, yes, yes, this is a fear. See, that's, that's kind of our reality. This is, and I think that's true in so many congregations across the, well, across the, across my district, across the synod. Um, this is, this is a fear that, well, God really isn't working. We're going down the tubes. Well, what do we do? And, and I say to them, well, I have a surefire method to get people in the pew. It's marketing 101. Tell them what they want to hear. Tell the people what they want to hear, and they'll probably show up. Give them the things of men, again, as we'll get to, or maybe we won't get to because I'm talking too much. Um, <laughs> the things of men rather than the things of God. Um, and, and, and people will come. And then they can, then, so then they recognize, recognize this kind of stark contrast of depending on our own reason or strength rather than simply depending on how God reveals himself to, uh, to have sent the Christ for the sake of our salvation. And that where two or three are gathered, there he is. His word is still at work. His word is just as powerful today as it was when he said, let there be, and everything came into existence. So also he says, let there be a believer and faith is instilled in the hearts of those who are not believers. God is not silent. God is not asleep. God is not dead. He's still at work. He's at work in the confession of the saints today to take this good news out into the world. 
And so, Pastor, as we look at that boldness is, like you said, built on the rock that the steeples may fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever, as we hear in the Old and New Testament. And, and that, that, that's what we stand on um, above anything else, that you might be able to get people in the pews, which I don't even know if that would be true nowadays. Um, but what you're going to stand on is a hope that transcends all of that. And he continues, if I could, move on to verse 19, because I want to make sure we really dig into this, is he speaks about the keys of the kingdom. And this is an important theme throughout the book of Matthew, the kingdom, you know, Christ as king, Christ reign. What does that mean? Now, all of a sudden, we're hearing about keys. Can you break that down for us? Often we call it the office of the keys, how would you teach that to somebody as you hear these words in verse 19? Okay, well, in order to get in that context, I have to do, I have to do verse 18 a little bit. Oh, okay, here um, we go. Okay, all right. Sorry, but I, <laughs> but I think you can't do it without doing that because there's some confusion about verse 18. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Ah, Too yeah. many people, I think, think that is a sort of a defensive position as if Satan is attacking the church and we're defensive. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The gates don't attack. Gates hold something back or hold something in. So God does not perceive of his church as a defensive position. We are out there boldly confessing. The gates of hell can't stand against it. This is why Jesus came uh, to destroy the works of the devil, First John 3, 8. Um, or Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, to free all those who through fear of death was held captive all their lives. This is why Jesus came, okay, to break through the gates of hell and free people. Now you can understand what these keys are all about. Yeah, yeah. Mm. The key, the, the gates of hell are broken open, and the the doors to heaven are uh, the doors to heaven are open for them to enter. This is what uh, this is how God uses and establishes the office of the word or the office of pastor, uh, office of the uh, uh, of the of the forgiveness of sins. So the keys of the kingdom open the kingdom of heaven through the forgiveness for those who have been freed from the, the gates of hell that have held them, in, uh, held them captive all, all of their lives. So this um, loosing and binding is extremely important. It is the, it is the work of the church to loose uh, the gates of hell uh, for those who are uh, for those who are in faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus is, uh, as the Book of Revelation tells us, is the one who has the keys of death and Hades. He breaks the doors open, and and now we hear in in this text that uh, Peter and the disciples, although there is a singular emphasis on Peter at the beginning of this text. Mm-hmm. Um, but later on, it comes to all the disciples. The gates of hell are broken down. The doors to the kingdom of heaven are opened through the loosing of sin. Uh, loosing of sin. And, the, and it, that authority is given to all of the apostles. By the time you get to chapter 18, verse 18, they, all of the apostles have that. It's spoken to them. Now, this continues, just to put it in kind of a contemporary context, to this day, in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, newly minted pastors are asked in their ordination vows, will you forgive the sins of those who repent? So it's a reference to this text, loosing the sins of those who repent. Unfortunately, as it appears in the agenda, it's a grave error, omitting the retention of sins. Now, everybody at CPH is going to hate me, but I'll say it anyway. Um, when I do ordination vows, I oh, I just insert. And will you retain the sins of those who refuse to repent? Because that's the full context of what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The office is given the keys, or the church is given the keys, and they, um, and on your wording transfer or give it to the to the office, the office of the Lord, the pastor, uh, to loose to say, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven, and that pronouncement is the same as if it's heard from the mouth of Jesus himself. That's what Jesus is saying. 
I ha- I hold the keys. And now I'm giving it to you. You are going to speak this powerful word. And it is a word just like the creative word uh, in Genesis chapter 1. Because it's bringing out of death into life. It's creating life where there was no life. It's op- clo- uh, tearing down one gate and opening the doors to the other. It's, it's just an amazing event that uh, transpires in these few words here. So, Pastor, as we look at that, when do we see this at work in the church? We call our pastors to do this. We have this in ordination, installations. Um, when do we see this at work in the life of the church? It is heard every Sunday in the corporate confession. And I know this makes, at least I've heard as pastor, some people not from the Lutheran tradition and perhaps some even from the Lutheran tradition get a little uh, nervous when they and they hear the pastor say, uh, in the stand by the name of Jesus Christ, I, I forgive you. But there it is. This is what Jesus just said to Peter and to the apostles. I give you the keys. So the pastor standing in the stead of Christ, uh, our Lord and Savior, says, I forgive you. Now that's the corporate confession. It's an important part of the life of church, uh, life of the, uh, of the saints. But I would be remiss not to also mention that our confession has a lively sense of private confession. That is where an individual believer uh, comes to his or her pastor with a particular sin that is burdened in them that they can't seem to get rid of so that they can not wiggle out of the corporate absolution. That is, when the pastor says, uh, in the sin by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you, the person in the pew who's really bothered by their sin doesn't say, yeah, well, He's talking to everybody else, but he's not talking to me. (laughs) So you go to the pastor in the private setting, private confession, and say, Pastor, this is really bothering me. And the pastor says, there's no wiggle room for you here. Jesus died and rose again so that your sin, yes, even this sin, this besetting sin, this thing that's troubling you, it is forgiven. And in the eyes of God, it is removed as far as the east is from the west, and it's thrown into the depths of the sea, and God promises, I will never remember it. You are forgiven. Go free. It is a, a marvelous gift, um, both corporate confession absolution and private confession absolution are a gift that God gives to his church through this office, what we're talking about, the office of the keys. The pastor is able to say uh, to those who repent, your sins are loose. The gates of hell have been broken down by your Savior, Jesus Christ. The key, uh, the doors to heaven are opened, and you are welcomed as a, as a full and free child of God. It is said so beautifully in, in, the, in, the, in the small catechism. Uh, confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution. That is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, which is what you just exactly said. There's no doubt when, when the gates of forgiveness are opened, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. This is what happens whether the church is you know full every Sunday and huge, or like you mentioned, those congregations of 30 and 20 and 12 people, the gates of heaven are opened and people receive that blessed absolution from the pastor as from God himself without doubt. That is one of the joys I hear every time, and you said it beautifully for us today yeah. to be able to have that confidence as we hear it. Pastor, I don't, I don't want to move on too quickly, um, but we've gone through 13 through 19, and 20 <laughs> kind of puts us in a whole new realm. So 13 through 19, anything else you want to highlight? Um, I think we I, – I don't know how your time is going, so <laughs> – Let's, let's go on. Yeah. We have about 10, uh, not even 10 minutes, eight minutes left in our time. Right. So I'm going to read 20 all the way to 23 um, for our time. Good. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. 
But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So, I, Pastor, I, I kind of want to skip verse 20 because I, I think we're left with a lot of questions and many theories. But I do want to really hit 21 to 23, which might be for the rest of our time, speaking about Jesus' foretelling of his death and resurrection. This isn't the first or the last. This isn't the last time he's going to say this, but it is vital and also shows us a little bit, reveals us a little bit about Peter. What? It, why does Jesus foretell his death and resurrection? Because it's necessary. <laughs> Ooh, that, was a, that was a great open Amen. door for me. All right, verse 21. Uh, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must. It kind of falls flat in English, but in, in Greek, it, it is necessary. So the must, uh, the the must translates, it is necessary. And then that verb, it is necessary, um, is, is usually completed by complementary infinitive. In this case, we have four of them. So just look at this. Uh, there are four infinitives in the Greek. They, it's kind of hard to see them in the English, but it is necessary to do what? One, to go. Two, to suffer. Three, to be killed. Four, to be raised. What's Jesus doing here? He's defining for the disciples what it means to be the Christ. It is necessary for him to do this. Now, who knows what all they had in their mind, what they thought to be the Christ. Very likely it was tinged at least a little by the common sense, uh, uh, the common expectation that he would be a great leader. He would reinstate the glory days of David and Solomon, that Israel would be a powerful nation, and so on, so on, so on. And now Jesus blows all of that out of the water with these four infinitives that are necessary to go, um, which is kind of akin to this whole idea of his coming into the world, going into the world, incarnation, and so on. To suffer, I'll come back to that, um, and then two two passive infinitives to be killed and to be raised. Um, none of that fits in their expectations of the Christ, and and perhaps we could say, you know, if we were designing God's plan, we would say that doesn't that's not what we want. That's not what we expect. <laughs> um, to go to be suffer to be you know, to be killed and to, and to be raised. So, um, just a word on suffering. The others are maybe acceptable in general Christian parlance, parlance today, but suffering is right out. Uh, we just uh, Americans will not receive suffering as an expectation of the life of the saint, uh, let alone the life of the the Christ, the one who's going to win this all for us. Um, so this is a, this is every bit of, as explosive as Peter's confession. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit of God leads Peter to say, "You are the Christ," and then. The Holy Spirit leads Jesus to say, <laughs> this is what is necessary for the Christ to do. Go, suffer, die, rise. It's, 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 uh, and, and you see the um, response to how explosive this is when Peter answers him. Uh, this doesn't make any sense to Peter. Right. And so Peter takes him aside, um, rebukes or dishonors him. Um, uh, what's translated there, far be it from you, it's sort of an idiom. Uh, it's literally, it's mercy be to you. It kind of means God be merciful so that this doesn't happen. Um, but he's, he's dead set on it because he uses a double negative, uh, Peter is, in that in verse 22. This shall not ever, never, never happen to you. Mm. So here's what's cool. <laughs> Jesus turns to Peter. Um, Mark has him looking at the disciples and turning to Peter, I implying that he wants everybody to hear this. Now, get behind me. Um, so there, there's a, some ambiguity there. What is Jesus saying to Peter when he says, get get behind me? Is he trying to say, you know, get out of my sight? I don't, I don't want to look at you. Is he trying to say, uh, get out of my way? You're a stumbling block. Or, or is he, I think, saying, get in the proper position by following the word of God. And since we're not going to get there, I'll just say in verse 24, the same word is used for take up his cross and follow me. That's the proper position. Get behind me in the sense of following the word of God as you're supposed to. So 
go back to 23. Peter, get behind me. Satan, whoa. That's pretty hard on, on Peter. Um, I think by the use of the word Satan as opposed to devil, Satan the accuser, devil the deceiver. I, I would expect the deceiver, but it seems to me Jesus is trying to say, by your misspeaking the word of God, you're accusing me of not following God's will. You're not, you're accusing me of not doing what's necessary. So you're a stumbling block. And, he, and here's the, here's the kind of the, the hammer. You're not setting your mind or you're not thinking the things of God, but the things of man. And this is the contrast that's been kind of set up at the beginning with what other people say, what do you say, what does the world say, what does God say? The world says we want a hero that wins in everything. But God says the Christ will go, suffer, die, and be raised. And this is the position that we take in the confession. He is the Christ. All of that's, all of that's rolled into. So those four infinitives are rolled into our confession. You are the Christ. And we believe, teach, and confess that you will go out into the world, you will suffer, you will die, and you will rise for us. Pastor, we have about a minute left in our time. How would you summarize our text and encourage our listeners with these words? That's a big one. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can do it in a short amount of time. There are a lot of aspects to being the Christ. This, you know, these few verses cover a lot of ground. They don't cover everything, but they cover a lot of ground. Um, that is, uh, that in this text, Jesus is revealed as a prophet who speaks and lives God's word. Um, he is revealed as the son of the living God, so truly God. He is revealed as the builder of the church. He is revealed as the leader of the church that attacks Satan, not just defends, but attacks Satan. He is revealed as the follower of God's word to the point of death and the savior of the world. And all of those, your listeners can take comfort in because God is the one who is acting to bring out their confession into the world. So it's not as if, um, you know, some might cast this as a sort of imperative to all of us that if we don't make the same confession that Peter makes, then we're not good Christians or that, you know, we need to buck up and get tougher. No, God has revealed this and he works it in us. And he's working it in you, dear saints, dear listeners. He's working it in you through his Holy Spirit, working in word and sacrament to make this confession in your words and in your actions every day of your life. God bless you all. Pastor Terry Forkey, District President of the Montana District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, giving us God's strong word from Matthew chapter 16. Pastor Forkey, thank you for bringing us his gifts. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.